In our first film, we looked at Hitchin in the bright summer sunshine. We showcased an attractive, vibrant town, widely considered to be one of the best places to live in Britain. Like all ancient towns, however, it does have its darker side, which we will be exploring in this second film. There will be tales of grave robbers, highwaymen, and life in the dreadful workhouse. But what is winter without Christmas? So do not despair, there will be merriment as well as the macabre. During the day, Hitchin shows off its many fine buildings and rich variety of architectural styles. But of course, things look rather different at night. If I could work my will, said Scrooge indignantly, every idiot that goes around with Merry Christmas on his lips would be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Ebenezer Scrooge, the central character of Dickens' ever popular A Christmas Carol, was the very antithesis of the Christmas spirit. Yet, through his initial rejection of festivity, an eventual conversion to someone who knows how to keep Christmas well, Dickens shows us the special place that Christmas had in the heart of his fellow Victorians. And of course it's from the Victorians we get many of our modern Christmas traditions. Not least the setting of ghostly tales in the festive season. Like many ancient towns, Hitchin has its fair share of ghostly tales, many of course centred on the graveyard. But perhaps the church bells designed for that very purpose will keep evil spirits away this evening. In 1828, the recently buried body of Elizabeth Whitehead was dug up and taken by the resurrection men, the grave robbers. To prevent further such thefts, the authorities erected stout metal gates around the hallowed ground and it was patrolled throughout the night by the parish beadle. Whether or not you believe in the supernatural, St Mary's Church has certainly had a turbulent history. In 910 AD, a Saxon timber church was burnt to the ground in the wars with the invading Danes. In 1115, a hurricane hit the town and again the church was damaged. 1292 saw a violent storm with many houses flooded and the church again suffering great damage. And in 1298 an earthquake resulted in it having to be entirely rebuilt. And then in 1304 the roof collapsed and a whole new church 
had to be constructed. Happily, since then, St Mary's had stood stable and elegant at the heart of the town. Anybody making a study of the history of Hitchin would be most wise to consult with its own historian, Reginald Hine. Hine's style has been considered florid, over-exaggerated and too dramatic, but there is no doubt that he had an encyclopedic knowledge of the history of Hitchin and its people. One of my favourite passages from Hine is his description of the Great Fire of Dead Street in 1845. Sheets of insatiable flame, seeking new worlds to conquer. Sparks carried by the high wind onto the thatched stables of the Half Moon Inn, and on once again to consume the Lancasterian school. Firemen worked tirelessly in the hope that they might save the town, and in the grey light of the morning, a charred heap of ruins and the mangled body of James Foote, crushed to death by a fallen wall. OK, Hines certainly exaggerates this incident. The town was never really in danger of being destroyed by this relatively modest fire. However, the school was very badly damaged. It was insured for £200, but the repair bill came to £212. Happily, the good folk of Hitchin had a whip round and the school was saved. In 1907, Reginald Hine set off to nearby Minsden Chapel with his good friend, the photographer, Thomas Latchmore. They were hoping to catch an image of the ghostly monk who haunted those walls, having been murdered there, it was said. They came back jubilant, having captured an image of the ghost. This image was published in Reginald Hines' History of Hitchin. However, it was, of course, a hoax, and the ghostly cloaked figure was probably none other than Hine himself. Tragically, Hines suffered from acute depression for all of his life. On the 14th of April, 1949, he ended his sorrows by throwing himself in front of a train at Hitchin Railway Station. As a historian, I am rather sceptical about the supernatural, but over my many years of working here at the museum, I have been told some interesting tales by volunteers and visitors. A few years ago, one of our longest serving volunteers was having their lunch in the museum offices next door. He turned and swears to me that he saw three or four young Victorian children standing outside looking in enviously at his sandwiches. He turned again, and they had disappeared. Many of the tales I hear are based around the Fitch family, who lived here in the Hadmaster's house from 1857 until 1902. I was summoned to the house one day by one of our visitors, who swore to me that she saw Mrs Fitch walking around here in her kitchen, large as life. In the 1950s, we have some interesting oral history testimony from children who were here at school at that time. Some say they heard the footsteps of a man limping across the corridor above the infant school. Mr Fitch is known to have had a club foot and one leg shorter than the other.
Hitchin Priory was founded in the early 14th century and is the ideal place to come and explore some medieval Christmas traditions. In the early Middle Ages, Christmas was not the most important festival on the Christian calendar, being overshadowed by Epiphany and Easter. But the prospect of having a feast to brighten up the bleak midwinter was not to be missed. At Yuletide, many landowners were generous to their tenants, allowing even humble peasants to enjoy a modest feast. But it was of course the aristocracy who took indulgence to a whole new level. In 1213, at King John's Christmas feast, 200 pigs, 1,000 chickens, and 10,000 salted eels were all washed down with 24 hogshead of wine. Whew. Christmas carols remain almost universally popular, but for serious-minded clerics in the Middle Ages, caroling, which means to sing and dance in a circle, was considered too boisterous and too frivolous to hold inside their churches, so they were banned and it became the outdoor activity that we enjoy today. So, caroling gradually came to replace the earlier but similar practice of wassailing. Wassail comes from the Anglo-Saxon, meaning be thou hail, or good health. People would go from door to door, offering a song and a drink from the wassail bowl in exchange for presents. The wassail bowl contained hot mulled cider, usually. Hot mulled cider is an excellent stimulus for lusty wassailing. Love and joy come to you, and to you your wassail too, and God bless you and send you a happy new year, and send you a happy new year. However, Christmas was also a time that highlighted the huge gulf between the rich and the poor. Poor families had the agonising decision of whether to spend their pitiful income on heating or eating, and Scrooge-like bosses rarely allowed time off to celebrate. Those out of employment faced the even more hideous prospect of life in the workhouse. It is Christmas Day in the workhouse, and the cold bare walls are bright with garlands of green and holly, and the place is a pleasant sight. For with clean washed hands and faces, in a long and hungry line, the paupers sit at the table, for this is the hour they dine. Those are the opening lines of Christmas Day in the Workhouse by the campaigning journalist George Robert Sims. Written in 1877, it was a damning indictment of the workhouse system. Don't be fooled by the cheerful tone. In the poem, Sims describes how the rich salve their consciences by giving a feast to the workhouse residents at Christmas. But for the rest of the year, they were left with very pitiful rations indeed. This wall marks the boundary and is the only thing remaining of Hitchin's Union Workhouse, which was built in the year 1836. At that time, Hitchin is recorded as having nearly a thousand paupers out of a population of just over 6,000 people. The workhouse only had room for 250 inmates, so the other 700 had to make the best of what was known as outdoor relief, basically handouts of clothes and food, but no accommodation. The workhouse and its unforgettable depiction in Oliver Twist brings us back to Dickens. Charles Dickens had strong associations in Hertfordshire and often stayed at nearby Nebworth House with his great friend Edward Bulwer-Lytton. 
and from Nebworth House he set off one day to visit a local celebrity, James Lucas. In 1849, 36 year old James Lucas was devastated by the death of his mother. He had inherited a great fortune and became paranoid that his relatives would steal it from him. To guard against this, he barricaded himself inside the family mansion, Elmwood House, which stood near to the pub which is named in his memory. He did not leave the house for 25 years. But James was not the usual sort of hermit. Although he never left the house, he welcomed the many visitors keen to converse with this increasingly famous celebrity and spoke to them through the barred windows of his house. Dickens was one such visitor, but he took against Lucas, finding his self-imposed act of incarceration misanthropic and self-indulgent. He depicted him most unfavourably as the irascible Mr Mopes in his short story Tom Tiddler's Ground. On the 17th of April 1874, the postman was unable to rouse the hermit and became concerned for his welfare. He alerted the local constabulary two burly policemen were dispatched and it took them nearly 20 minutes to break into the hermit's sanctuary. Inside they found a pitiful scene with Lucas prone on the floor. But when they lifted him up to carry him out he wailed pitifully at being removed from 25 years of self-imposed incarceration. He was carried away to a local farmhouse where he was cared for but soon died having suffered a massive stroke. The Hermit of Redcoats is certainly not the only eccentric character linked to this area. Long before the idea of the Garden City was born, Letchworth was administratively and socially effectively a part of Hitchin. And it was here at Letchworth Hall that in the 1830s and 1850s the young men and maidens of Hitchin would come to disport themselves with its merry and eccentric owner, the Reverend John Allington. Some thought Allington a fool, although he had graduated from Balliol College, Oxford, with distinction. Already the inheritor of a great fortune, he made a brilliant marriage, but tragically his wife died young, and this seems to have had a marked effect on John. Previously an orthodox preacher, Allington now began to expound from the pulpit a doctrine of free love. He rode a hobby horse bicycle up and down the nave during services and wore not the sober vestments of a clergyman, but a leopard skin cloak. And in that same leopard skin, Allington would wander the streets of Hitchin of an evening, leaping out upon unsuspecting citizens for his own amusement. His parties at Letchworth Hall were legendary. The booze flowed free, there was wild music and practical jokes, with Allington himself drinking all comers under the table. What a guy. If the Reverend Allington was merriment uncontained, the Vicar of St Mary's from 1690 to 1728 was quite the opposite. The contrary man, Francis Bragg, had come to the clergy late as a last resort, having failed as a lawyer and a poet. He was an arrogant disciplinarian and made himself highly unpopular. Bragg's chief notoriety came with his prosecution of Jane Wenham, the so-called Witch of Walken, in 1711. Reginald Hine recounts that Bragg seemed to take great pleasure in practising the cruel arts of witch-finding upon this poor woman's body. He persecuted her to such an extent that eventually she was willing to confess to anything. Poor Jane, found guilty, was sentenced to death. Happily, the wisdom and mercy of the presiding judge prevailed and he was able to obtain for poor Jane a full pardon. Perhaps chastened by this experience, Bragg's later life was noted for a series of praiseworthy theological writings and his 38-year tenure of St Mary's is commemorated here.
Hitchin lies close to the A1, the Great North Road, famously the route of Dick Turpin's desperate flight to York. And Hitchin has a highwayman of its own. On the 6th of January 1690, John Everett was baptised at St Mary's Church. Reginald Hind points out that his family were men of substance and good character. Young John would prove the exception. His career started most promisingly. He trained as a lawyer, but he tired of this desk-bound occupation and sought excitement in the army, seeing military service in Flanders. But of this too he tired, returned to London and became an officer of the court. This provided insufficient entertainment for the young man and he took to the road with his brace of pistols and his horse, which leapt like a greyhound. He was a rather dashing figure. Sometimes he would tip the coachman that he had just robbed a shilling and he never killed any of his victims. Caught once, he was confined to Newgate Prison for three years. His behaviour was so good that on his release they made him a turnkey of the same prison. But again the road was to call him and he resumed his nefarious occupation as highwayman. Caught a second time, there were to be no second chances. On the 20th of February 1728, he took his last ride along Hoban, his last stirrup cup at St Giles, and sprucely attired, he leapt into eternity at the Tyburn tree. Stand and deliver your money or your life. For Victorians, Christmas was the most important festival of the year, and it's from them that we get many of our modern traditions. Christmas trees, Christmas cards, even Christmas crackers were introduced during the Victorian period, and even Scrooge himself came to love it. I will honour Christmas in my heart and try and keep it all year long. So, with Scrooge's conversion to a jolly Christmas figure. This has brought us full circle in this little look at Hitchin's darker side. So may I wish you all the compliments of the season. And a Merry Christmas. Shop local. Shop in Hitchin. This Christmas. <laughs>